Now, Connie Goldman looks into a different set of values. There is a current book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, an Inquiry into Values. The author is Robert Persig. He studied chemistry, philosophy, journalism, and he spent two years in India learning Oriental philosophy. Connie Goldman of public radio station KSJN in St. Paul, Minnesota, interviewed Persig in his St. Paul home. In her own words, she said she learned some of the confusions and agonies of writers' real-life odysseys. Reading is an enemy of writing. You don't realize that until you actually get into something, that when you're doing your own thing, when you're concentrating on your, on your book, uh, if you see a movie or uh, uh, watch a TV show or get involved in any kind of uh, exterior activity, it sort of takes over your own internal TV program and it ties you all up and it stops you. And of course, that's why uh, writers become such recluses frequently, is that uh, it's not that they don't like people, it's just that they have to have that long period of uninterrupted silence in order to collect everything they want to say together. So actually that occurred in this book where so many problems were coming up, uh, old people calling up on the telephone in the morning, and I finally bought a pickup camper and took off for the North Shore. And there up by two harbors, uh, uh, located the camper in a spot in April before the place had opened. And I just sat there in this camper uh, day after day, uh, week after week, and wrote the last six chapters of the book. In my opinion, those are, those are six of the best chapters in the book. And they were written because I had a complete consciousness. Uh, uh, they were written out of pure boredom, and that's very important, I think, in writing, is to be really bored. Because uh, if your mind is jammed with any kind of extraneous thoughts, you can't get the full picture of what you want. And yet I know that some mm. of this book was written while you were working full-time during the day writing computer manuals. That's true, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, computer <laughs> manuals uh, are notoriously boring, and uh, they don't compete as much as TV or... Uh, uh, motion picture or radio or any of things like that with the with the mainstream of your life and <clears throat> in that arrangement I got up before I did the computer work I get up at two o'clock in the morning and go down to a little place on Lake Street in Chicago Avenue and uh, work there at, at two in the morning at two in the morning yeah and then uh, uh, sit down and sometimes write and sometimes not write because uh, uh, sometimes it just no thoughts would come, but I got into the discipline of just getting there and not particularly having anything to do except write this book. And then with that kind of attitude, getting something out. Once in a while I'd, I'd have a good day, once in a while I'd have a horrible day, but every time I'd have some kind of day, and that way the whole first draft of the book got written. And then after that, uh, four hours was over, I'd come home and have breakfast and go off to my job where they began to notice I wasn't as perky as some of the other people because uh, uh, I'd already put in four hours of my day. For me, it was like one o'clock in the afternoon when, when they were starting their eight o'clock in the morning. And then at lunch, I'd always have my head down on the desk and I'd take that lunch hour for, uh, for a, uh, a, a nap. And uh, then when that was over, I'd hit the four hours in the afternoon <coughs> and go to bed at night at six o'clock and just uh, conk out then. That seems like a horrible schedule. But For how long were you on that schedule? Two years. And uh, uh, when you look back at it, people say, well, how could you do something like that? But this was really a, a compulsive book, uh, a book that uh, if I didn't do it, I'd feel worse about than if I did do it. So that, that two or that two o'clock thing just became a regular habit. And once I got into it, it worked out all right. Have you ever written anything before that you felt such immediacy about, such compulsion about, to use your word? No, always before I'd been, uh, <coughs> in, in uh, quotes, a writer. Uh, that is, I was, I was trying to fulfill a role of being a writer. Here I am sitting at a desk with a typewriter or with pencil in hand, and now I'm going to write something so that uh, when I'm done, I will have something people will read. And it was always a separation of my real self from the act of writing. There wasn't this one-to-one -one relationship that occurred on this book. In this book, it was just, uh, uh, I could almost watch my hand moving on the page, and there was no volition one way or the other. It was just happening. And people have sometimes seen that in the book, that it's, that it's a very direct book. It's very on. This is obviously the person himself talking and, and not a role player. 
I think that, to some extent, is what's giving it its success. They, they, they really feel there's some sincerity here. And to back up a little, I could say when I first started the book, it uh, began as just a little series of essays. I thought it wasn't going to take more than two or three weeks at the most. Then it became two or three months, and before I was done, it took four and a half years. But these first essays were just a little kind of uh, uh, es a, a little dissertation on the relationship between technical values and human values, uh, bringing up some uh, information that I picked up in, in my work as a technical writer and, and uh, applying it to the situation. And this gradually expanded and expanded and expanded until th these essays are kind of the nucleus of an entire novel. So we really have a, a, what we call a, f a fiction, a nonfiction work embedded in a fiction work, uh, or, or we'll say a, a dissertation embedded in a narrative. We'll put it, be, put it a little better. In one place in the book, you say something, uh, an expression that one has heard many times before, something about it's, it's better mm -hmm. to travel than to arrive. Did mm -hmm. you know where you were going to arrive when you were taking that journey, when your hands were automatically mm -hmm. typing that manuscript? No, you never do. Uh, that phrase, it's better to travel than arrive, is one that stayed with me since childhood. I've always had a wonderful time on trips, and then just as we get to the destination, I feel so let down, so sad that the trip's going to be over. I feel so stupid because all through the trip, all I could think about was getting to the destination. And so what I'm trying to say is, is to remind people of, of a principle which is actually quite important in Zen, is, is that you should pay attention to where you're at right now and not where you're going to be in the future. And uh, I think that's the, the root of that expression, it's better to travel than arrive. It is better to travel than arrive. I could say also you never, you never stop traveling, really. You never do arrive. It would be a better, a better way of putting it, maybe. What happens to you when you do have your eyes just on the goal? What happens to the, well, let's see if I can remember mm -hmm. one of the analogies you used in the book, uh, the appreciation of the minute-to-minute the -minute experience? I guess that's fairly strong in the book, that, that, that uh, eternal insistence that you watch what's right here and right now and not anything else. Uh, uh, the past and the present are always, or the past and the future are always contained within the present. And, and uh, uh, it's so important to see this. And yet it's so difficult to see this truly that, that the Zen people have invented meditation for that purpose. I, uh, well, I don't know if it, meditation is for that purpose, but frequently in meditation you do get pulled right into the present. Your thoughts about the future and your thoughts about the past tend to die down and, and you're just sitting there, you see. And, that's, and that gets you into the now, into the here and now. Your fixing is like Zen's sitting. Uh, sitting is the simplest thing, is probably the simplest Zen practice there is. But of course, uh, the same things you do in sitting, you do in everything else. And at, in this book, I simply decided to talk about motorcycle maintenance as a Zen activity, although I've never objectified it. Uh, I've tried to do that because I feel that uh, frequently people get the idea that Zen is something apart from the everyday world, and it never is. And, uh, and I'm trying to bring that point home with the use of motorcycle maintenance. Uh, this is not an exotic activity, at least normally considered. This is not going and sitting on a mountaintop or contemplating the petals of a flower. This is just getting in there and getting your hands greasy, and yet that's still Zen. And uh, that's, that's sort of what's behind the title. And uh, so uh, while I do, as a matter of fact, sit regularly and I'm a, uh, a, a practicing Zen Buddhist, uh, the book didn't go into that. Uh, that. Enough has been said about that by people who know it better than I do. But I did want to emphasize that uh, this everyday aspect of Zen and, and see that by concentrating on everyday aspects of life, you can uh, expand your understanding of the world just as well as by uh, the more exotic techniques. At, at one point in the book, anyway, mm -hmm. you introduce the idea of being stuck, of stuckness. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. your word, I think. Yeah, that's right. Stuckness. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that in relationship to mm -hmm. the journey and the self-exploration and how people usually react to being stuck and how oh. you react to it? Well, I'd, I'd said in there that, and that is 
probably made a major contribution to motorcycle <laughs> maintenance of this book, that when you get stuck on fixing motorcycles, that's not a bad moment. Uh, that's actually a pretty good moment. And I've, the times I've been stuck, I've, I've been able to catch myself at being stuck, and instead of getting mad, just gone off and had a cup of coffee. And I notice whenever I'm stuck like that, that, that uh, if I look at the clouds, the clouds are much more beautiful. And if I, <laughs> yeah, that's a, getting a little bit sentimental, but uh, uh, I find that at the very moment of stuckness, if you just stop and look around you, you find the world is very real. If you remember back in your own life periods when, when, when your life was very vivid, it was usually during a hang-up, at least for me. So, so I think stuckness is, is uh, very good for people and that uh, when it comes you should welcome it because it won't last long. Uh, you always are, you, I think people in Western culture are trained to believe that if they get stuck that may be the end of the world. But uh, life doesn't stop. It just goes on even when you're stuck. That feeling of being stuck in your personal mm -hmm. life, in your job, mm -hmm. in any inconvenience that mm -hmm. sets your schedule off yeah. is so overpowering to us that mm -hmm. it sets us into fear, mm -hmm. uh, actual panic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't we get in the way of our own growth in the middle mm -hmm. of that stuckness by not taking it and yeah. just living mm -hmm. it? The stuckness is kind of what, what you call non-doing. Non and our whole society is set up for doing. We, uh, we always ask a person when we want to know about them, well, what do you do, you know? Well, actually, uh, in Zen, the, the correct answer is, I don't do anything except sit, you know? And they say, you just sit around, don't do anything? Yes, exactly, you know? And I say, well, something wrong with that. Uh, I mean, what do you really do, you know? And the reason this question is asked again and again and again is because people are predisposed to think that unless you are doing something, something's wrong. And this is a part of the value of the sitting meditation, is that you're instructed just to sit there and prevent yourself from doing anything. And you, and you find that uh, this is not as easy as you th thought it would be. You think, well, gee, uh, now I don't have to do anything. That's easy. But you discover after about 10 minutes that this is very, very hard and that there are as many degrees of difficulty in non-doing as there are in doing. And uh, to become skilled at non-doing is quite as difficult as becoming skilled at doing. But then after you acquire both skills, skills at doing and skills at non-doing, you find that if, if you're stuck in traffic, it doesn't uh, create frustration. You just uh, swing into your non-doing life. That is, uh, if your car won't go forward, you just sit in your car and, and uh, you build your life that way. It's almost like photosynthesis and respiration, you know. If a plant just gets nothing but sunlight, it's very harmful. It has to have darkness, too. And uh, in the sunlight, it converts carbon dioxide to oxygen. But in the darkness, it takes oxygen and converts it back into carbon dioxide. And I think people are like that. You have to have some periods of doing and some periods of non-doing. And when you get both of them in a, in a mixture back and forth, then you really lead a much fuller life than if you're always committed to doing. So. Uh, so many people say, well, I, I don't see the purpose of, of, of Zen, you see, or the purpose of just meditation. And uh, the reason they don't see it is because they're committed to doing it. You don't do anything, you know. But when you don't do anything, all the garbage in your head that's accumulated from all this doing during the day starts to come to the surface and float away, and your life is purified again, or at least your, your, your uh, mental life, uh, psychic life. And uh, this is very valuable, and I think it's a... A practice which is coming in very strongly, and not just in Zen, in all the meditative uh, disciplines. What you've just said makes me think about the other concept that runs mm -hmm. through the book, maybe the most primary one, mm. the idea of quality, well, that's and how your perception of mm -hmm. quality develops. Yeah, I had a, a friend I sent the book to in California, uh, uh, Mrs. Abigail Kenyon, and she came back with the best description of the book I've heard yet, and also the shortest. She says it's a turtle's back. And uh, the name of the turtle's back is quality. If you rest four elephants on top of that quality, you can put the world on it, and everything rises from there. And so, <clears throat> really, the, the term quality is the central term of the book, and that's what's meant by inquiry into values. We're trying to find out what quality is. But by the time you, if, if you assume there is such a thing as quality, then you find out what you have to do to your philosophy to uh, uh, adopt this thing called quality. You find your whole philosophy is upended. You have to do what's called a Copernican revolution. 
you have to say that quality is the source of subjects and objects rather than that subjects and objects are the source of quality. And that, I hope, is, is the philosophic um, turtle's back that will gradually gain acceptance. You say it took four and a half years for you to write all of this, and that doesn't mm -hmm. surprise me in the reading of it. Mm -hmm. But how many years has it taken you to arrive at what you wanted to write? Oh, yeah. Well, that that's the... This is uh, the outgrowth of a whole life experience. I can't think of a time when that book wasn't starting, you know. Even, even at the age of four, when I... Uh, uh, learned to read and write in England. Uh, I remember when I left, my teacher gave me a little book called The London Primer. And uh, for this particular teacher, uh, to learn to read and write was the most important thing in the whole world. When I left, that was just stuck in my mind, and, and there it was, you see, all through these years, and finally emerged in the form of this book. Uh, fortunately, this teacher is still alive. We've been corresponding every year since I was four. <laughs> and she's got a copy of the book now. And uh, uh, when my English publisher wrote me, we're very pleased to be publishing your book. I said, you don't know how pleased I am. You know, I learned to read and write in your country. And so I'm looking forward to getting back to England eventually and, and uh, seeing this teacher. And, and this book promises mm -hmm. not to mm -hmm. be reviewed and accepted as, well, just an interesting book. Uh, but uh, some of the advanced comment on it is that it's close to a great book, that, mm -hmm. it's, that it's an important book, a mm -hmm. very important book. How mm -hmm. is this settling with you? Is it frightening for you? It is, is it rewarding it for you? I'm just sort of trying to stay as cool as I can at this point and see how things happen. Uh, it's all a new experience for me right now, and, the, and uh, uh, when time reporters come into your living room, it just uh, creates a scene that uh, is uh, sharply different from, you know, any kind of life you've led before. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I'm really playing it by ear right now and listening every moment. Uh, my big effort right now is just to keep cool and stay calm and, and see what happens. Uh, they are talking about bestseller in New York. This is the expectation not an expectation, this is just the thought that's on their mind. And of course in the publishing business uh, they expect to pay for nine losers with that tenth winner and when they smell a tenth winner they just go overboard for it. They, uh, I just had a letter from the vice president in charge of sales at Morrow that's publishing and he says we're just leaving no stone unturned to get this book moving. And I talked to uh, uh, B. Dalton uh, 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 bookseller Alan Kahn and he said that uh, that's true. The company is selling very hard on this book, and, and uh, they're really trying to make it a bestseller at this point. Uh, of course, they can only go so far, and that's to get it over a certain threshold, and after that, the book's got to do it on their own, uh, its own. But I believe that uh, they have faith that it will make it, and uh, uh, right now, it's just like waiting for uh, returns from an election. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe a landslide, maybe. Maybe not much, but we'll see. Bob, how do you plan to protect yourself? You're a private person, and Very your most so, creative yeah. mm -hmm. thinking and, and work is done mm -hmm. in solitude. That's right, yeah. Well, this is part of the problem. I think I have an obligation to respond to people, and uh, I'll do that until I feel that the obligation to get on with my next book is more important than that obligation. Then I have this pickup camera, and I can just jump in it and take off, and nobody's going to know where I am, and I have all the solitude I want. So I think for a while I'll be uh, answering all the letters I get, all the mail, and, and uh, until I feel at, that this is really wasting my life, and then get on with the second book. Bob, we talked earlier about the younger you, the one that all your life has been writing this book. Mm -hmm. um, I notice here that in some of the advance copies were sent to prominent mm -hmm. people and Eric Hoffer mm -hmm. has responded that uh, he feels that you're one of the that you're a born writer and this is one of the truly good books of our time but he says that he thinks it says here uh, can I just quote sure, from it? Go ahead. It is a miracle that he came through the 1960s the Persigs mm -hmm. I have known at the Berkeley campus during the free speech movement and later mm -hmm. have disappeared without a trace it's perhaps mm -hmm. Persig's precious patch of squareness that saved him. <laughs> it shines like gold in the gravel oh. of a river. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to comment on his comment about you? 
Well, of course, the book sort of goes after squareness, and he's uh, uh, saying that, that actually it's the squareness in the part of the person who's going after the squareness that saves him. I believe Hoffer got into a lot of uh, conflict uh, between uh, hip and square and, and decided to defend the squares. Uh, he's, he's a wonderfully honest person, and uh, uh, I think he had a, a right cause on his hands. Actually, I like to think that I'm both hip and square at the same time, that these two terms aren't uh, irreconcilable, that, uh, in fact, the book is a kind of a reconciliation of those two worlds of thought. So I think it's possible to to be a square motorcycle mechanic at the same time a, a groovy rider and that this isn't uh, a conflict for anybody. Or, or it's possible to be both a square and a groovy motorcycle mechanic, we'll put it that way. And there's a lot of uh, people who don't think there is such a thing as groovy motorcycle maintenance uh, don't understand motorcycle maintenance really at all because it's there to be found. And when you see a really good one, one who's a real artist at it, that you know right away that there's such a thing as an art of motorcycle maintenance. A lot of people have doubted whether that's a worthy subject of art, but I think that's just snobbish. Art is, is anything you can do well, anything you can do with quality, anything where there are options for doing it well or poorly. And uh, there are very few things in this world that don't have options for doing it well or poorly. So you can make an art out of anything. And I think that making of an art out of your technical, technological life is the way to solve the problem of technology that the book takes up. I think there's no question that there is less contrivance in this book than anything that I can ever remember reading. Okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's just blatant, honest sincerity. I can almost yeah. feel the two in the morning sessions <laughs> now that I learn about them. <laughs> I can tell. Uh, there's a thing, something I can tell you. Uh, when I was a student at uh, in the graduate school of the university here, uh, I uh, spent almost oh, nine months studying under Alan Tate, uh, who was a, a poet and uh, uh, teaching a graduate seminar in composition. And I remember I took in one story. I'd come back from India at that time, and I. Uh, I uh, brought him one story entitled Ramji and the Crow, which is about a servant that we'd had and a crow that he used to talk to. And I thought this was a very beautiful story. I really impressed with it myself. And I showed it to him, and he read through the whole thing, and he, and he says, well, what do you want to write all this exotic stuff for? He says, write about what you know. And he said, if you write about what you know, and you do it you know, carefully and sincerely and make sure it's, it's really what you know, so that'll be plenty exotic to everybody else. And and in this book, I've really tried to do that. And I've tried to justify what I've done to myself by saying, well, it may be right, it may be wrong, but it sure is what I know, you see. And that, that I suppose, is responsible for that feeling of, of directness that you get. Uh, it was just trying to get a one-to-one -one relationship between myself and, and what's on paper. Did you ever have any fantasies at four in the morning while you were writing the thing about how the world would receive it? Well, I had them, but uh, they wore off. You know, <laughs> you, after about three or four months, uh, there's nothing keeping you going except this this compulsion. Actually, the best days in writing. For some reason, I woke up last night thinking about this. The best days in writing there on Lake Street were the days when I was neither enthusiastic nor depressed. Uh, some days I'd say, oh, this is the world's greatest writing, and then I'd look at it the next day and it was just awful. And sometimes I'd cut it so badly that uh, I'd really ruin something that really wasn't as bad as I thought it was. So in the days when I was elated, I would, I would put in stuff, but my critical faculty had, had uh, weakened so that I was getting in a lot of slush that really wasn't valuable. And on days when I was depressed, my critical faculty was working way too strongly and I'd throw away perfectly good things. So, so the very best day is the day when you don't really care whether it's good or whether it's bad, when you're just sitting there writing. When you trust yourself. Yeah, or, or, or when you just don't even, don't e are not even conscious of yourself at all. It's just a, uh, when you get that total lack of self-consciousness, then it happens. Then it starts coming out on paper. But sometimes it takes months before you can get to that point, you see. And you have to throw away those months of work because you realize then, at one point, all of a sudden you're hitting, you know. It's just coming out strong. And I've heard that said by many, many writers. The way to learn to write is just to write. And what they mean is that if you keep up the discipline sooner or later, it's going to just uh, reach a point where nothing else is motivating you except the, the words themselves. See? But, Bob, yeah. that is exactly what the book is about. When you talk about 
doing an activity, planning it and feeling separate from it and evaluating it as you go along. Mm -hmm. You're really separate from what you're doing. That's right. Yeah. Then you talk yeah. about fixing the motorcycle and mm -hmm. the only thing that exists is what you are doing right then, the mm -hmm. involvement in it. Mm -hmm. So you're really talking about your riding, you're exactly. fixing your motorcycle, your mode of most successful living is all being the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all comes out to be the same thing. Actually, the sitting is the same thing. You start yes. out feeling, oh, Lord, uh, I hate this. And then later on you feel, oh, boy, this is wonderful. And, and you're wrong both times. It, it, uh, <laughs> it's just sitting. And uh, the book was just riding, and the motorcycle is just fixing. And, and when you get down to that nothing special thing, there's a very famous late Roshi from California, uh, Shunryu Suzuki, who used to say, uh, used to talk about just sitting and nothing special. And uh, to some extent, in this book, I've tried to talk about just fixing and nothing special. But of course, when you take that attitude, everything special comes in. You know, uh, you try for nothing special, but in the process of getting there, everything comes in, including the kitchen sink. And uh, uh, but the goal is always just just to live your life without too much fuss about it. And that was Robert Persig, author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. An inquiry into values. Connie Goldman talked with Persig.